Thank you for staying with Citizen Extra. Before we took the break, we were listening in to Ipsos um, on their findings as regards um, um, a new survey that's being released today, um, which will focus on the release of national survey findings from data that was collected between the 11th to the 23rd of May. Among issues they're looking at is household and economic conditions. They're also looking at the president's performance, um, you know, over the last three months, and indeed at political party and coalition alignments. That's among issues that the survey um, will be giving findings on. Let's listen. In. And uh, one, one other thing before we get to the demographic profile. I hope all of you have on your desks a copy, either a hard copy or a soft copy on your computers of the publication of Electoral Polls Act of 2012. We wouldn't want to see any of you or your editors uh, in committee prison or having to pay a half a million shilling fine for failing to adhere to this act, which has taken effect 12 months before the 8th of August this year. Any poll related to an election in Kenya published within that 12-month period must comply with the publication of Electoral Polls Act passed in, I think it was July 2012, signed into law by then-President Kibaki in, I think, November, and uh, you can find it on the internet if you have any trouble getting a copy of that before you publish. Let me know and I can send you a soft copy. But there are certain requirements. Now, in, a, in an electronic broadcast, it, I don't think you can be expected to comply with all of the for information that that act requires. But at least you have to have it on your website. And I'm, I'm a bit worried because I've seen some of your media houses publishing electoral polls from us and other companies so far this year without complying with the act. With all due respect to my friends in the political class, we have enough difficulties dealing with their reactions in a natural, expected way. In any case, we don't need in our business of doing election-related surveys or doing surveys with election-related questions to unnecessarily attract um, anger and even uh, legal uh, um, suits in court because we have failed to comply with the act. We do it, but we don't have a media re uh, outlet. We don't own a newspaper, a radio station, or a television station, so it's up to you people to comply with that act. Make sure your editors are familiar with it. Post it on the wall in your offices because you'll be receiving not just from us but from other companies election related polls also okay we first look at the demographic profile of the sample and I would encourage you to compare this profile with the other ones we've done over the last few years some of the variation may relate to just statistical variations but the, any population in any country is always changing in terms of its demographic profile if you have another source of information that tells you, for example, that 50% uh, of adults in Kenya are Catholics, and you see we only captured 23%, then you better challenge us about our survey methodology. Why are Catholics undercounted here? Um, or if you have information about main source of household income, and you have reason to think that outside of our margin of error of plus or minus two, there are far more or far fewer Kenyans working in the public sector than 7%. Then challenge us. Because this is what we got from our respondents. And I should also mention in that regard that to the best of our field team's ability, we try and restrict interviews in urban areas to weekends. Because most people who are in the formal sector, whether private or public, between Monday and Friday, they shouldn't be at home during the times our, our, our interviewers visit their houses and make their household selection. We 
unemployment status. Now, my colleague Ellie and I were discussing this the other day. I think some of you probably saw Checkpoint on Sunday, where there was a discussion about unemployment. And we were told that the team that works on Checkpoint had sought a number of sources to find out what's the actual number of unemployed people in Kenya. And they so Ipsos there um, in their survey findings. Um, we are now going to be talking to Patrick Igunza. Uh, we do know that the Kenyan Central Bank has kept its benchmark lending rate at 10%. Um, this is in a bid to reduce the threat of demand-driven inflation. We're going to be talking to Patrick now for the latest on that. Patrick, what do you have for us? We'll be talking to Patrick Igunza shortly. He doesn't seem to hear me. Um, but before that, in other news, uh, shaping the day, former Devilation Cabinet Secretary Anne Waigoro has moved to court seeking to have the Public Accounts Committee report quashed. Waigoro also wants the court to bar the EACC from conducting a thorough lifestyle audit. In the period, the former CS wants the respondents stopped from commencing fresh investigations. She argues that the findings of the Public Accounts Committee on the Special Audit report dated May 2016 on the accounts of uh, the NYS that she's responsible for the entire loss of public funds at the ministry during her tenure is irrational. Our guest in studio this morning, Catherine Rangoy, she's a leadership consultant, and Kemari Kamenzo, who is an advocate. Thank you very much, lady and gentlemen. I think um, Kemaru will be joining us very shortly. He's not with us in studio yet, so I'll be speaking to the lady in studio. Catherine, let's talk about, you know, the integrity issues, unresolved integrity issues um, that Anwai Guru is facing in other jurisdictions where there are integrity issues. People that are seeking elective op uh, positions actually step down until um, such issues are resolved. Thank you so much Lillian this morning. Mine is just to say at times it, it's good to see a woman when gets into governance but here comes a case of accountability. What we see the former CS being uh, accounted for, it's not a case of humanity, this is a case of accountability and to be precise a case of, a case of procurement. My point on this, I think and I'm sure like any other Kenyan, regard to article 38, the former CS has a right to be voted and, and vote, so whatever she's taking to court, it's her right as a Kenyan mm -hmm. and also her to wait on her to be found guilty. Currently, we cannot say she's very innocent until proven guilty. And you know, Catherine, we do know that um, there are other politicians that are facing similar unresolved integrity issues, most of them male, um, and they are also seeking elective positions. Um, in the case of uh, Anne Waigoro, would you say these are double uh, standards? The fact that uh, she's being subjected to a lot more scrutiny, and this is arguable, than her male counterparts. I, I'll take you back, Lillian, to the days when she had to be woken up to people getting to her home, of which this her own lifestyle, this her own basic life, and to me it's now becoming out of the national figure of the integrity issues to more personal and more to be a woman case. So for me, I look at it as more personal because with regard to other integrity issues, this is not the only case we see public funds being at, at risk or even at power of being accounted for. So for me, it's more of uh, being a woman, it's more of being victimized than more of a public funds issue. And you know, we know that she's previously attempted to bar the EACC from investigating her. In terms of, you know, where she currently stands, you know, in the political field, um, her aspirations to be governor, you know, what do these integrity issues mean for her candidate? Are they likely to cost her um, this position? I will say clearly, like I said when I was starting, uh, the former CS, whatever she's being questioned for right now, it's a case of public fads. We look at other cases like case of the former, the egg case. This is not a case of humanity, Lillian. This is a case of where she had to provide people do procurement. And as we know with the Kenyan system, the PDD Act, 
she's not necessarily being there to see the procurement of a pencil, a pen, but again, it's coming back to her being in office. So more to that, I look at it as not more of an integrity issue, this is more of a personal issue and where she sat from and where she's going as now a new governor. But when you have all these independent institutions, um, Catherine, um, you know, questioning her integrity and indeed asking for accountability as regards the NYS scandal, we know that it's not only the EACC, we know that the civil society has also called not only for Waigur um, to be bad from um, vying um, for elective office but you know for other you know persons as well other persons who have expressed interest um, in buying for political positions who have unresolved integrity issues um, is this a, really a personal attack on um, Waigoro herself and looking at the strength of our oversight institutions um, do they have the might to actually make this call I'll, I'll look at it this way, 791 million, it's purely a lot of money for any Kenyan. It's what I pay for tax, is what you all pay for tax. But again, there are more issues that have been there before, the chicken and all that. But again, when we look at Waigoro's case, it's becoming more of a criminal. It looks more of she's affecting the livelihood of Wanjiko. To me, this should be looked well into account until each and every coin, until each and every page is turned on her legality matters, until then we can't hold her guilty uh, for now. And you know, in her response, um, she argues that the findings of the PAC on the special audit report dated the dated May 2016 on the accounts of the NYS that she's responsible for the entire loss of public funds of the ministry during her tenure is irrational. So looking at the fact that she's taking collective responsibility for the loss of funds during her tenure, um, does she have, have a valid argument because surely she cannot have been in this if at all by herself? I look at it as Waigoro, the former CS, as a leader. It, it's clear when you sit in an office when you are supposed to take watch of your fellow people, you take responsibility on any ill or any good. So whatever she's doing, she's just saying, here I am, the former CS, and we go, take accountability with me in person at it. But we shouldn't ignore the fact that we should go to court, let all pages be turned, let all accountability issues be reasoned at not just to log on to her own backlog. And the committee recommends that uh, Waiguru should not hold public office if found guilty. How um, you know, feasible is this? We are 69 days to the August polls. Um, of course, um, she will be on the ballot. So how do you see this playing out? It's, it's coming both ways. This is what the people on the grassroots are looking at. Uh, Kenya, we have come at a point where we want people to deliver. It's not about what you have done before in the office. Wajiko has now become more clearer. Wajiko now knows what one is need to do as a person. I believe, to my own view, from where I sit, the former CS delivered. What we can wait on, Lillian, is to wait for the time, the judgment to come, and when the legal team do their due course, Within the 69 days, we'll be able to say whether the CS will be able to run. But as for now, this is not a more humanity issue. It's more of accountability. And the National Assembly taking it as a special report, to me now it comes more of personal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Catherine feels that this is a personal um, onslaught on um, Anne Waigoro. We are now joined um, in studio by Kimari Kamenzo, who is an advocate. Kimari, what does the law, Kimathi, what does the law say about unresolved integrity issues for persons seeking elective positions? Well, thanks uh, so much. Uh, I think the reality is that in terms of the special audit report, it uh, existed before it was merely uh, adopted uh, by Parliament because it was a committee report of the PSC. The content of the report is to the effect that further investigations would happen and if found guilty, uh, the former CS uh, responsible for the devolution ministry would be barred from holding public office. I think that's slightly different from um, where one is looking at the issue of um, allegations as opposed to uh, where guilt has actually been established. Mm -hmm. Typically you'll find where it's an issue of allegations, the responsibility actually does shift um, to the person themselves because you'll find in other democracies where certain allegations are raised, people do step aside uh, or are suspended and that kind of
thing to allow for investigations to take place. How long are these investigations likely to, uh, you know, to, to, to go on for? We, we have 69 days to the polls. We know that um, she's interested in, in, you know, you know, going for public office. So are we likely to see any results between now and 69 days? I don't think so. Um, and I think the reality is uh, that uh, the DPP's office is in collaboration with the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. I think they are swamped at the present. Uh, first of all, you would be aware that the IEBC will be seeking clarification on certain matters uh, regarding candidates and you have a large number of candidates uh, looking at the various electoral seats that we have. But I think second is important to note that the issues of integrity are of a continuing nature so that even if somebody assumes office, um, it would be then viewed as uh, somebody who is sitting in office who then is under investigation. So investigations would not cease just because an election has happened. Mm -hmm. So Kimati, you know, the accused has moved to court seeking to have uh, the Public Accounts Committee report quashed. She also wants the court to bar the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission from conducting a thorough lifestyle audit. Can the court bar these agencies from um, actually carrying out their mandate? She's requesting um, to be, of course, she's requesting the court to bar um, these agencies from conducting an audit on her. Well, thanks for that. I mean, there are a number of uh, constitutional issues as far as that goes. You have in our constitutional structure the concept of separation of powers, where arms of government work separately but are meant to coordinate with each other. Now, there has been an issue um, in the past uh, between the courts and parliament. How far can the courts tell parliament what to do and how far can parliament go when the courts do issue orders? I think we do not have clear judicial philosophy as far as that goes. Um, would the court be able to issue uh, an order that uh, either suspends or quashes report? The answer would be yes. Um, would it be supported in law? You know, there are various mechanisms. First of all, the matter would have to be heard in full um, before a final decision is entered. And then, of course, there are the appellate mechanisms that take place. Um, but technically, yes, the um, court would do that, but the court must do so in, within the confines of the law to be able to establish um, that uh, um, either uh, the agencies are acting in bad faith or um, these matters have already been attended to and that kind of thing because uh, um, I think uh, one of the concerns that perhaps uh, she um, uh, has and um, this is without prejudice to what her counsel might say is whether um, an audit of this kind would be a repeat exercise or it is continuation in part of investigation. Um, so yes to your uh, question, yes um, the, the courts would have that power. Um, however, I think that I would hope that power is exercised responsibly and um, in cognizance of the law. And just to balance this conversation before we cross over to the CBK, um, Kimathi, I had put this question forward to Katrin, but, um, you know, just to get a balanced opinion on this, the fact that there are other persons that are, you know, see, you know are going for public office that have unresolved integrity issues, most of them male. Uh, Waigoro's case, being a female politician or a female political aspirant, does this catch her flat-footed? Do you see, uh, you know, a level playing field here where on one one hand, we have a lot of other, um, you know, candidates um, with unresolved integrity issues, but then we have this particular person, uh, you know, being directly, for lack of a better word, attacked. Well, and I think that may not be very true. Um, I think we all have witnessed uh, uh, what was going on with respect to uh, the governor of uh, Mombasa County, that is uh, His Excellency uh, Ali Hassan Joho, uh, the kind of investigations that he has had to keep up with. Um, so to say that this is only targeted to uh, the former CS of devolution um, because she is a woman would not be accurate. However, I think we need to have that wider conversation as to um, our political structure, whether it encourages or discourages women from participating in elections. And I think that's a conversation that's happening in various other places. Indeed, you would be aware um, that uh, the head of state uh, and I think also uh, the presidential candidate for uh, the NASA coalition have at various points raised the issues of uh, women representations and the whole issue of uh, the two-thirds uh, uh, um, representation in parliament, both the Senate and uh, uh, the National Assembly. Uh, but these are issues that are being addressed in different forums. In this particular matter, I urge that we look at it um, as an objective matter, that 
that we are looking here at an individual um, who held public office and who is being asked uh, um, um, to be accountable as far as that goes as to whether she is guilty or not I mean that's a fact uh, that needs to be established I'd also like to uh, mention that that report does not just mention her it also mentions others who have been involved in uh, the same issue so once again uh, both when you look at the wider um, perspective and specific to this investigation um, it actually is not just uh, uh, her who has been involved it's not just the uh, ladies who have been um, um, mm -hmm. called upon to account okay thanks for clarifying that we are now crossing over to the central bank of Kenya which um, has kept its benchmark lending rate at 10 percent let's listen in well thank you very much indeed uh, Lillian Muli, as you've indicated, we will be coming to you live from the Central Bank of Kenya. We have been waiting for the CBK governor who just walked in, and so I will not take much time. Instead, I will just request that you allow us to just mount our cameras in, and then we will be having that live feed in not so long a time. That will be more important other than me just uh, uh, trying to indicate what he will be talking about, and yet he's already begun that process. So I will toss it back to you in the studio first and then in about a minute or two we will be coming to you with that live feed from the press, press conference governor that's none other than patrick Njoroge. that's patrick igunza at the central bank of kenya we're going to be getting an update um on the latest happenings there before that we are going live to us in Gishu county where john Owanyama has been following up um on the ibc receiving um papers uh, from um, county women reps. We do know that um, Gladys Boss Cholet is expected uh, there um, any time from now. And of course we are looking in and listening into what's happening there. That's Mohira Chipcock. That's the woman rep on the ANC ticket. We'll be looking at the, you know, the role of the woman rep and, you know, having a discussion around that. There's been a debate that they've done nothing significant in the National Assembly. Um, looking at um, the next parliament, um, we'll be looking into issues of how best um, their presence can be felt. Uh, but before that, just to continue with the fact uh, that um, Anne Waigurum has moved to court seeking to have the public accounts report quashed and we're going to, of course facing unresolved integrity issues um, Kimathi in other jurisdictions like you said when there are you know unresolved integrity issues people step down um, until investigations are complete people who are um, going for public office how best would you advise in such a situation that persons find themselves under investigations um, handle such issues um, I think the whole issue is uh, uh, partly individuals but also partly uh, the institutions that are established. Firstly for individuals where um, people would be able to, uh, who are holding public office or who are seeking to assume public office, uh, would be able to uh, look at um, uh, the perspective of uh, the fact that where there are unresolved integrity issues there's always a question of trust as far as that goes. Um, so that's on the part of the individual because there is nothing that stops an individual from saying hey I am stepping down. Um, indeed, uh, the former devolution CS did actually uh, indicate that uh, she would uh, be stepping down uh, from her office as a devolution CS uh, on account of her own personal considerations. Um, on the institution side, it's also the question of the maturity of our institution. And I'd like to raise two issues. First of all, the timing um, regarding some of these issues, uh, because one would hope that when you're talking about um, either a parliamentary committee um, or an institution such as the EACC or the DPP's office, that they would carry out um, investigations in a timely fashion. And timely fashion would mean that you take into consideration all matters, including the fact that some individuals may be um, negative affected if you delay in executing your responsibility such that you find yourself in a situation when we've been talking about the NYS matter and this report is only being adopted by Parliament in May um, late May when uh, uh, we are almost set for the election period and an individual can justifiably argue that why did you wait until this point to actually uh, begin the investigations or, or to conclude um, the investigations and give such a report uh, in light of the fact that this matter has been outstanding for a long time but I think the second issue with respect to institutions after 
after timeliness uh, is a whole area about integrity with respect to institutions where um, there have been allegations raised that um, sometimes um, the institutions are used um, for uh, nefarious uh, um, objectives um, where one is looking to um, oppress or um, make others submit um, to uh, their whether political or other intentions that these institutions are used for that purpose and I don't think we are yet at the level of public trust where people can actually say we are fully confident as far as these institutions go. Now when you look at a place like the USA, uh, the Trump administration, um, uh, the Trump, um, uh, um, President Donald Trump who assumed office in January of this year, it's been hit by uh, numerous uh, um, scandals and you'll find in some instances special advisors have stepped down. There's actually one who I think is on record as the shortest serving special advisor and his issues were relating to links uh, perhaps with another world power, that's Russia. Um, you have um, people like uh, uh, the CIA and F by FBI um, individuals being um, um, asked uh, questions as far as that goes. There was uh, a gentleman, Mr. Comey, um, who uh, actually was uh, prevailed upon to step down because of certain issues in terms of handling of investigations. So you actually have a culture where no one is untouchable. Right now in a hush hush, well not so hush hush because it's all over Twitter, uh, people have begun talking about the impeachment of President uh, Donald Trump. And these are things that are being discussed in the open. And that shows some level of maturity uh, in the institutions where people can actually place trust in public institutions and say that wait a minute um, we actually believe that these public institutions will not just stop at, uh, um, uh, uh, at the minnows they'll actually uh -huh. go to the very top right and we'll be coming back and looking at our institutions as we wrap up this conversation whether they're toothless or whether they actually carry any weight uh, but for now CBK Governor Patrick Njoroge is addressing members of the fourth estate there as regards um, the lending rates let's listen in uh, India have been uh in terms of their production, volumes have come down, but they continue to command a premium uh, because of the quality of their teas and so forth. Um, in in uh, Sri Lanka, I think the issue there was more flooding, uh, so it's not clear how much is going to affect their, their production, but uh, there is concern that volumes will not be, uh, will not be as per, and I'm talking of in the, in the market, in the international tea markets that uh, the volumes there may not be as before, but what is clear is that these countries will continue to command a premium in their exports. That is on tea. On uh, horticulture, I think also the same, that uh, this has been, has been improving. Um, but I think the ones, are, and we've discussed this before, so I'm not going to belabor it, but I think the points I would make is imports also have remained low. Of course there are seasonal issues, or rather uh, everything isn't smooth. So, for instance, uh, just recently we imported a lot of rolling stock for the SGR, which was already anticipated, but okay, you can see that imports in, that, in those particular months uh, have surged on, on uh, imports of machineries and so forth, and transport equipment. Nevertheless, the current account has uh, remained as far before, meaning uh, actually the current account to March we estimated at 6% and we continue to estimate uh, oh, to project a current account def uh, deficit of 5.8% for the, for the year, that is 2017, which as we have said before, we see that as a, as a, as a sort of a, an inappropriate um, level of our current account deficit. There are a few other things I would want to mention here. Tourism, of course, there has been, this is a low season, we all know that. But I think we have uh, seen a lot of interesting conferencing. Uh, that is something that has been, and also the regular tourism, meaning personal holidays and things like that. But I think the point here is, yes, there has been uh, some conferences and uh, there, there is also prospects of that going forward looking at the bookings that are there. Remittances continues to do well. There is something like 2.5 percent, a little less than 2.5 percent of our GDP and that actually has been strong, has continued to grow. Even as in South Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, in 2016 remittances fell by 6 percent. So in other places, Sub-Saharan Africa generally fell by 6 percent, but we from 2015 to 2016, we have, uh, we have uh, recorded a continued increase. That's all I want to say about the, 
well, maybe to finish off on the external sector, I would say that we have uh, ample buffers. Uh, not only do we have <coughs> policy buffers, meaning we have room to maneuver uh, in terms of our policies, but I think also in terms of our FX, our, our foreign exchange reserves, which are at all-time high records or levels, um, which, again, this gives us ample room for maneuver or, or in case there are shocks um, that come in the future. I haven't even added on to this the usual, the precautionary facilities that we have with the IMF. Just saying that we do have uh, ample buffers in this regard. Then I want to talk uh, to other points before launching into other uh, items. And the first of this is the credit slowdown, to give you some information on that. Actually, just a sense of where that is. I think last time when we chatted, I did mention to you that uh, the, uh, if you looked at the large sectors that contribute or that take up 60% of our uh, of credit generally. These are manufacturing, real estate, personal, uh, personal loans and all that, and trade. Uh, I should say agriculture, even though it accounts for something like 25% of GDP, only gets something like 4% of credit. So you could see it has a disproportionately low amount of credit going to this sector. But anyway, so 60% of credit goes to these four sectors, and as we mentioned last time, these sectors were, uh, were credit to them was actually not growing, was falling, and this uh, was, was, had weakened. And this is really contributed largely, or contributed the lion's share to the decline in credit that we have seen since December 2015. The good news is that actually now we talked about, last time we talked about a bottoming out. That's, those are my words from last time. But I think now we can actually say that uh, there has been uh, a rebound, meaning a positive growth. Um, and uh, not only has it bottomed out in terms of levels, but actually has begun to grow in the three sectors, manufacturing, real estate, and personal you know, personal loans and things. And I think this also relates to the, what is happening to those sectors. Meaning, for instance, manufacturing has actually begun to, we have begun to see positive signs there. Uh, recently, the PMI, for instance, that were on the man, from the were positive, they were relatively strong, uh, compared to a month before, a month and a half before, when they were rather negative numbers. So I think the point is that you have all the indicators in these sectors are pointing in the same direction, which is up, um, which is something that uh, obviously will be a concern for you, of interest to you. Then on interest rate caps, uh, we have already said that uh, we have been studying this matter. We do not want to react, uh, to have a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but rather let's look at the data, let's understand it and so forth. So today I will say a bit more, I'll give you the, what the data seems to be telling us so far. We still need to continue, uh, but I will, I'll, well, I'll, I'll talk about the, well, the directions in a minute. The first to point out is we continue, we at the Central Bank continue to monitor developments with regard to the rates cut. I think this is something that is clear to all of you that we, yes, we do need to monitor um, how banks are implementing this and so forth. The second, which is uh, also important for you to note, is that yes, the banks, The uh, return on equity and uh, return on assets, ROA and ROEs, have fallen since, have been falling actually since June 16, June last year. And uh, if I gave you the number, well, the ROE, for instance, uh, was in June last year was, for the entire industry, was something like 18.2. And uh, this has 
fallen in March to 13.6. I'm sorry, I do have April numbers, but uh, the ones I have here in my notes are uh, March. So I'll just give you the ones that are here and we can update them later. Uh, for Tier 1 banks, this was 34.7 in uh, June last year. And it has fallen to something like 23, no, yeah, 23.1. I believe it's 23.1 in March. So you can see these numbers have been falling. Uh, but I guess the point I'm making is you've also reported the, the lower profitability uh, or the lower levels of profits in some of these institutions, the banks and so forth. And I think it collaborates with these numbers. I hope we understand each other on this. At the same time, the, what has happened, and now I'm giving you numbers our developments in terms of lending and so forth. Bank lending to micro and uh, small and medium sized enterprises, that's MSMEs, has fallen 5.7% between August 16, August last year, and April this year. Even though actually small banks have increased lending to this sector, so if you, if you want to know who has reduced their, their lending to this sector, of course it is the large banks that have done this. I mean, this is, a, at least that's what the data shows. But nevertheless, the point is that lending to this sector has fallen. This is something we had uh, mentioned before, which is a concern. Uh, there are something like, if I'm not mistaken, something like 1.7 million uh, MSMEs in Kenya. Uh, the data on this can be found in the in the in, in that study uh, by or that survey from Kenya National Bureau of Sta Statistics KNBS uh, last year, which talked about this. But I guess the point here is that this is a concern because this is really where job creation is and will take place. This is really where. Uh, output, the potential for growth in output is and will take place. So I think this is a concern as we can just put it out there. Thirdly, number of loan applications rose. Uh, the number is something like 23.5%, but the values of the applications fell by 18%, which really means that uh, there has been Loans. There has been smaller size loans, so people are applying for smaller size loans, which is surprising, but we'll come to that in a minute. In terms of approvals, approvals increased. Uh, even their values, the total values fell. They increased by 35.7% and, and the values fell by 163 So again, you can see that uh, approved are smaller, meaning in terms of their size. What is going on in all this? There are two points I would want to make here, which is there has been that tightening of credit standards, and this we have, there has been a collaboration of this um, by other surveys that we have done. We've surveyed credit officers, we've surveyed them as, uh, the, the enterprises themselves, We've also, surveyed, we've, we've also done the uh, market perception survey and also talked to banks. So in terms of information, we are getting uh, information flows from different directions. So we are not just talking of one particular survey. But yes, there's a tightening of credit standards, which has led to the lower value. Uh, but also the riskier borrowers clearly are being uh, kept out. Of, uh, of this. Now, it's interesting that you, you, we don't know how many borrowers would want to borrow but never quite even get to the point of writing an application. You understand? I just gave you data on uh, applications. But, you know, so you go to your banker or your relationship manager and uh, he or she uh, may tell you, listen, we don't have, this, you know, we I'm sorry, we are, we, are not, we are not lending or whatever. We are, we, I don't know how they would tell you in a polite way, you know. I mean, I don't know if there's any polite way of, tell, of saying no, you know. Um, but in any event, so they'll tell you no. And you wouldn't even get to the point of uh, signing 
filling in a form. Of course, if, if you are lucky, you fill in a form and then you, you appear in my statistics of applications, right? So I don't know how many of us don't even get to our statistics. That's the point I want to make. So even as you see these numbers, please bear in mind that uh, there are those that either directly, meaning they feel that uh, they won't even get, so they, they are demoralized or whatever the word would be, that uh, they feel that they won't even get to, uh, to getting an application or a loan, so they don't even bother to go. Uh, and there are those who probably bother to go, but then in the end don't even get to, uh, to sign in the application. And then there are those that actually bother to go, they then get into an application and never get the applications approved. So there are these tiers. I just wanted to be clear that it's not, a, it's not just one statistic that we need to look at. Um, now another thing to mention, lending to businesses has fallen uh, and uh, relative to corporate. So there's more corporate lending uh, re rather than <coughs> businesses. And now this we are not, we are moving away from the uh, medium and small enterprises that uh, I mentioned a moment. Shorter term or shorter tenure, five years, uh, five years, five year loans have fallen, uh, so they are concentrating on the lower tenure. Now we could talk some more, but I think I want to stop there on that. Just to say that the impact on the economy, as you would ask, well, I think mentions and we we are not we are still working on the impact on the economy uh, directly in terms of growth um, we are back in studio with uh, Kimaki Kamenso, who is an advocate and Katrin Wangoi, leadership consultant. Um, we are moving away from the interest rate decision um, and looking at issues surrounding Anne Waigoro, um, former devolution cabinet secretary, who has unresolved integrity issues. Catherine, when we talk about um, you know, the strength of our oversight institutions, uh, looking at anti-corruption agency EACC um, and indeed other, the civil civil society um, and other bodies that have come out to question integrity um, issues surrounding persons that are going for public office. Are these institutions more reactive as opposed um, to being perhaps, you know, um, more effective in their role as uh, oversight institutions? Thank you so much, Lillian. To my view, uh, when you look at the institutions we have, it's more point of two pages and two double standards because when we party with the Waigoro's case, these are case of where at one time she was cleared, at one time she was said to still in waiting for a legal matter to be heard. So when I look at what we have, the EACC talk about the IABC and all the other the institutions, it's a case of question. Do we have the right institutions in place? And I'll answer and say yes we have. It's us, the people of Kenya, that we need to stand and govern what we have to give it more power and more reality to being workable mm -hmm. to the situation. And Kimati, looking at the timing now, because the people of Kirinyaga have spoken um, in favor of, you know, Anne Waiguru for governor, at least a section of them, her supporters. So if her past was an issue, looking at the timing of this now, why didn't the Public Accounts Committee um, expedite the hearing or decision regarding her candidacy? Thanks, Tillian. Um, fortunately for the National, unfortunately for the National Assembly, uh, sometimes it's hard to uh, understand some of the um, actions and reports deriving from there. I'm sure they would have an explanation around the issues of uh, delay in evidence and um, time it took to compile the report. But to be very fair, Lillian, I think it has taken an inordinately long time to be concluded for that special audit report um, to be tabled and finally approved by the National Assembly. Um, so I think there we have been disappointed. What are the reasons for it? Um, it's a hard guess to find out what are the reasons for the delay and unfortunately the nature of investigative action um, really at the end of the day the only point that you can challenge delay is when you finally get the report you um, can't uh, go and tell them PSC um, you need to hurry up um, uh, you haven't uh, finalized on this report because in our constitutional structure it is assumed that each of these arms of government are independent and are staffed by competent people um, who are able to be committed to assignments before them.
Mm -hmm. I'd like to add a point though that uh, in all this I think there's also the role of political parties um, because political parties are really the entry point for many um, of the people who are seeking elective offices and I think um, there's something to learn here where political parties can uh, uh, begin uh, perhaps um, uh, pushing the bar a bit higher the threshold a bit higher in respect of um, um, integrity matters and start raising questions. Now obviously political parties do not have in investigative powers um, but I think um, there is a role that they play in terms of fostering and encouraging um, um, integrity within our political class by setting certain standards that could be higher than what we have. That said I want to agree with uh, Catherine in a certain respect that part of the problem that we have with our institutions are we Kenyans, um, the, the individuals who staff these institutions that um, many of us there are issues of integrity so perhaps the EACC does its job, the DPP um, are, are doing their job and then there is uh, perhaps say somebody um, a, a witness who is compromised and we've had many instances both local and international where people who have given witness recant and say no it never happened as far as that goes. So I think that points to a problem within the fabric of our society. Mm -hmm. And you know as we close this conversation um, Catherine we know that it's a very competitive race for the Kirinyaga gubernatorial seat. Look Looking at um, you know Waigoro's uh, closest uh, challenges, do you think they have scored one against uh, her because you know of, of being rigged with scandals, uh, scandals that seem to be never ending, scandals that have made their way um, to the limelight only 69 days to the elections? Uh, Lillian, my, my point is this, the timing is not so clear why the National Assembly and the PAC are coming out at this time. Sorry to say so, the people of Kirinyaga have spoken. Let's wait upon the people as the legal fraternity does their job, as we see what the people of Kirinyaga will decide. And again, this is the part of majority. When Kirinyaga speaks, we should believe it's the voice of their own, and they know their own. So let's leave it to the Wajiko at the grassroots and let them decide. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, your parting words, Kimathi, should Anwar Goro be barred uh, from the upcoming uh, elections until, and maybe this is an unfair question, but I mean, uh, <laughs> coming from a, a law perspective, whether she should be, and indeed not only her, but other, you know, persons that are going for these elective positions who have unresolved integrity issues until they can ac account for their wealth, most importantly, we know that um, with the NYS, it's 791 million that went missing mm -hmm. during her tenure. Well, yes, parting short, Lillian, thanks say that. Uh, I mean, I guess that the first question was a bit hard to answer. Um, but I, I think there are various things that one needs to balance as far as it goes. Um, I want to be sensitive to Catherine, who I believe speaks on behalf of some of the Kirinyaga people who have taken a view on this matter. I want to be fair again to uh, the candidate, uh, the former devolution CS, uh, Anwar Igoro. But we also must be faithful to our legal structure. And like I said, perhaps the issue where, the place where these issues ought to have been vented, that are at the political party level. I think at this point, um, honestly, uh, the horse has bolted. It's very difficult to do anything, even though I did remark earlier that in terms of the integrity concerns, they are, if you look at the chapter 6 um, of our constitution, it's more living chapter. It's uh, one that is continuing that not only do we expect you to uphold integrity when you are vying but also continuously uh, during your term of office. So I think right now we must sit back and wait and deal with the consequences that we have. As I mentioned the special audit report by the PAC adopted by the entire National Assembly is more or less a conditional report. It doesn't bar the ex the devolution CS uh, from um, uh, running. Um, it just says that if guilt is established then um, that should uh, uh, automatically arise. In other words, she should then be bad as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for your time this morning. Katrin Wangoi is a leadership consultant and uh, Kimathi Kamenso is an advocate. Thank you very much um, for your thoughts. We are back with Brian O'Connor.